Good morning. Um, <clears throat> we're here in, I'm here in Door County Library and we're having, um, we're lucky to have Nancy Goldberg here with us. She's a master gardener who's been really greatly involved with the seed library that we've had started here in Door County Library. Um, and she's also in charge of the Heritage Garden at Crossroads, which is very interesting historic, based on historic gardening practices. Um, they also planted a few of the seeds from the seed library, I think, in last year. So she's going to tell us something about how she inherited the management of the garden and what they, their process is and how they um, restructured it a few years ago to do German gardening. Um, I do want to mention that we have a couple interest, a lot of good books on gardening heritage seeds. And in particular, I like this one, which is um, Putting Down Roots, which is all about Wisconsin um, folk cultural gardening um, from the old days, early settlers. And it includes German gardening and Polish and all different ethnic groups. So it's a really fascinating book. Um, Marsha Carmichael, who wrote the book, was here a few years ago to speak to the Master Gardeners, I believe. So mm -hmm. if anyone's interested, we can, you can look up some books on the subject or let me know and I'll help you find something. But meanwhile, Nancy, can we hear something about the um, Heritage Garden and Crossroads? Well, thank you, Laura, and it, I um, welcome the opportunity to talk about the Heritage Garden because it's become very fond uh, to me. I'm going to share my screen now so that um, you, we can uh, use the slides. Okay, well, the Heritage Garden is 23 years old. I've been working in the garden for five years, and the first year I worked there, I worked under uh, the tutelage of Lee Somerville, who uh, ran the garden for 10 years and I learned so much from Lee. So I can't, uh, I have to keep her in the back of my mind every time I talk about the Heritage Garden. So that's why I uh, titled this uh, with inspiration from Lee. Okay. Now, this is what the Heritage Garden looks like. I took this picture a couple of years ago. Um, in the middle of the summer, you can see the Black Eyed Susans in the front uh, that are in bloom. So this was probably taken sometime in August. And the garden is, is, is lush. It, it sits at uh, crossroads. It's attached to the Heritage Village General Store. Um, and if you haven't had, had an opportunity to come out and take a look at it, we welcome people to come in and uh, sit down. We have a bench there. So please, uh, it's free. You don't have to uh, pay any anything to uh, go into the garden. So um, please feel free to um, enjoy enjoy the garden. But this is this is sort of what it looks like. Is there a gate that you have to go through to get inside or are you allowed? There is a little gate uh, right in the front here. And sometimes there's a stone. We, we try to keep out the rabbits and the woodchucks, but uh, those stones are, are not to uh, discourage any person from coming into the garden. And, uh, but at the gate, it, you, it, you, can, you can just enter right through that gate at the, um, in the front. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is sort of what it looks like. This is, picture was taken uh, last year. We have uh, configured our, our um, garden in uh, German squares, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but this is just another picture of, of, of how it looks. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the origins of the Heritage Garden at Crossroads, how we planned uh, to make the garden a worthy representative of how our ancestors gardened. Um, we're going to talk about the German garden configuration that we are using now. And then I'm going to talk about some of the heirloom varieties of plants that are in the garden now. And um, it's, it's been a real learning ex experience for um, all of us that work there. So the garden, the garden was founded in 1997 um, by the uh, Sturgeon Bay Garden Club and uh, the Master Gardeners. And when it, when it first started in 1997, it was coordinated by Marilyn Cunningham for about 10 years. And she envisioned, a, she wanted an herb garden to be attached. She, she thought that that would be a wonderful idea to add to the Heritage Village. And um, so she contacted uh, Coggin at Crossroads. And if, you, if any of you know Coggin, if you have an idea and Coggin thinks it's a good one, she'll be supporting you 
110%. And that's what happened with Marilyn. Mar Marilyn got a lot of support to uh, start the herb garden. And she ran it for about 10 years. Um, she, Marilyn was a huge fan of hollyhocks. So we have hollyhocks lining the, um, the uh, wall of the general store in uh, remembrance of uh, Marilyn. And um, so then after Marilyn took over, the following 10 years, the garden was coordinated by Lee Somerville to create an accurate representation of an 1890 to 1910 garden. She added vegetables to the herb and she expanded the flowers with the outside of the garden at, that takes on more of an English cottage garden. Lee Somerville was born and raised in England and I think those that she uh, had, it, she took a lot of what she had learned from her childhood for, for the English cottage garden look. But she also she got her master's degree in um, looking at, uh, in, in studying and, and doing some uh, really uh, seminal research in uh, vernacular or, or kitchen gardens in Wisconsin particular. And she used the, what she learned in her research to, it, she incorporated that into what uh, was, uh, what we do in the heritage garden. Can I add something? Um, yes. Lee did donate all of her, um, the books that she used for her research, the Wisconsin Horticultural Society books to the library. So they're in the Lori History Room if anyone's interested in looking at them. They're, they're fantastic references. It's, it's, uh, there are things in, in that, uh, those uh, books that you, you really can't find anywhere else because of the, the work that she did. And this is how it looked um, about five years ago with it and with the uh, rose, which is how the English garden when they came here. And um, so that's, that's how it looked. But uh, in, so since 2017, uh, we've been a work of gardeners that's continuing the work of Lee. We, again, we take on a more historic look. Um, the plants are researched to align with an 1890s to 1910 kitchen garden. Um, and the emphasis is growing on vegetables and herbs that we donate then to the local food pantries in Door County. So since in, 19, in 2018, well, Lee left uh, in 2017, I guess, and uh, is now living in California. And before she turned over the keys of the garden to me, she said, uh, you need a new fence. So in 2018, we, or 2017, we put up a new fence. And then in 2018, we thought maybe we could do something a little different. And so we thought we'd try uh, a German design. Uh, I've, uh, history's always been a, a passion of mine. And being of German ancestry, I began doing some research on how the Germans who came to Wisconsin uh, gardened and thought that that might be an idea for um, the, the heritage garden. So the, again, the, the purpose of the garden always is to represent an heirloom kitchen garden. And the kitchen garden is the garden that the, the farm wife, that was her domain. And if she had a successful kitchen garden, that garden fed the family all winter long. So it was critical to the survival of the family. Um, again, it's an historical addition to the village buildings at, at the, um, the Historical Society. It's a free out, crossroads outdoor lab and educational research resource. And again, we, the local food pantry uh, it, it gets the benefit of, our, of what we grow. And it's a dynamic, ever-changing view of the past. That's how we, we like to look at it. And you can see we have wonderful soil there. And so you can see uh, these are scarlet runner beans with um, in the background are uh, a version of sunflower seeds. It's a sunflower maximus, Helianthus maximus are those yellow flowers in the background growing on the other side of the fence. So the seeding, we start our seeds, we collect and save seeds from, our, from our, uh, the vegetables we grow, grow in, the years, in the year before. And it's augmented by heirloom seeds from catalogs. And that would have been exactly how our ancestors did it in 1890 and in, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, seed catalogs were uh, it, just like 
in the in late January, I look for my seed catalog in my mailbox and now my on my email. Our ancestors couldn't wait to see their seed catalog come in their mailbox in the, the same the same time of the year. And so that's that's how we do it. And they're all heirlooms, open pollinated, so that it's we can save the seeds from year to year. And we donate some of our seeds to the um, seed library here in Door County. And we also then use some of the seeds from uh, the seed library for our, our uh, plants. We have an interesting seed in the, in the garden this year. Uh, Ken Poshke, who is an old gardener in Door County, has some seeds that are truly unique to Door County. And he donated them to the seed library. And so we're growing some uh, Ken Poshke seeds, bean seeds, it's a bush bean in the garden this year. So uh, we're excited about that. So Crossroads has a small um, greenhouse attached to the, its, its uh, south side, the south side of the uh, Collins uh, Learning Center. And so that's where we start our seeds and our crew gets together in probably March to April to begin the seeds depending upon um, what needs to be started early. And then we prepare the, um, the garden is during the winter, our garden plans and our vegetable varieties are decided by the garden committee. And basically the garden committee is anybody that's interested in coming to meetings and sharing a cup of coffee in the middle of January, February, and talking about seeds and gardening. And you can usually get several master gardeners interested in that. Um, Again, the, the seedlings are planted in the greenhouse. And then as soon as, as Mother Nature allows, the soil is prepared in readiness for the plants. That is usually though, uh, we don't usually start planting, planting our garden until June. We've just found that even though the last frost date may be um, middle of May to end of May, the ground is just not warm enough in uh, Door County here to get the seedlings and the seeds off to a good start. So again, the first year of our committee, we planted in rows in the traditional um, English fashion. But then the second year, a decision was made to transition to the, our German ancestors. And here's the growing. On the outside, you can see that these are, uh, on the picture on the, on the bottom, these are Missouri primrose, these yellow flowers. And they're really, they're about, they're fading now. They were in uh, full, full bloom about a week ago. And um, the picture on the top shows uh, some of the, the way the outside of the fence looks. And then on the inside of the fence, you can see um, the plants that, that we've got going on. It's fun to take pictures. And then we maintain it. There are many hours go into maintaining the garden. And we have a core group of seven to eight that meet in the garden two times a week to assess water and weed. We don't use any pesticides in our garden. And we also have an emphasis on companion plants to attract beneficial insects and ward off the unwanted ones. This year, because of COVID, uh, we have not planted um, a traditional heritage garden out there. So if you go out there this year, I, what I talked to, and we couldn't get our crew together, so because of the social distancing and everything. So I asked Coggin if I could put in a, what uh, I've called a victory garden to uh, just plant some tomatoes and peppers and some things and just, so I, I just, really couldn't stand the idea of that garden not having some vegetables in it and having a, a, the look of a garden. So we've got a, a one person crew that uh, goes out and uh, takes care of things there for this year. So it looks a little different this year. Okay, and, and we, we also, because Crossroads has a heavy emphasis on teaching, uh, that's, that's what we'd love to do too. We have students come out in, in usual times. Again, I'm talking usual times, um, looking at uh, for, forgetting the fact that COVID is with us now. But in usual times, we have students come out from various classrooms in Sturgeon Bay and Sevastopol and uh, learn about, uh, in fact, they help out. A lot of them help out in the fall with our, our garden cleanup and in the spring with our garden um, getting it ready for planting. But in the summer, we also have, uh, we, we participate in a lot of the activities that go on with Crossroads as well as the Heritage uh, Village and, and, and encourage folks to come in and see our vegetables and taste our vegetables. Because we don't use any herbicides, um, you, can, uh, you can feel comfortable 
picking a, 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 a ripe vegetable uh, from one of our, our plants and, um, and not having to wash it off too carefully because you, you don't have to worry about that. And we had a, a couple years ago, we had a, about a 15 year old uh, boy came in. He had never tasted a tomato. So we have uh, varieties of, of, uh, of um, cherry tomatoes that are nice and sweet for that, exactly for that uh, opportunity to allow a kid to taste a tomato and have it be sweet. I think, you know, maybe wow. can make him excited. I was, I was so despondent that he'd gotten that far in life without ever tasting a tomato. But anyway, we try to, um, to uh, hopefully encourage uh, kids to see the value of, of, of vegetables. And Nancy, I think there was a question um, that I can't see the chat myself, but um, do you I have any traditional um, perennial herbs in the garden? We do have uh, some uh, perennial herbs. We have um, lavender, we have, in fact, there's lemon balm. Lemon balm is, is, is wonderful. We have um, thyme, we plant rosemary, that, that does not come back. We have uh, walking onions. We have, I, I, I've got a list of it that, that's later on in the talk, but that's, yes, we do have some perennial herbs in, in the garden. That the herb garden in the last couple of years has, because we've had a, a, only about four or five people that come out daily, it, it, we haven't spent as much time in, in the herb garden as we, it, it's on the side of the garden. Um, mm -hmm. In the years past, focusing on the vegetables we're growing, but this year I've got the time and I may go and, and sort of tame some of the things that are in the herb garden, some of the things that are going out of control and um, get, get back to um, making that a little more manageable. I think Marilyn Cunningham might appreciate that. And then we harvest and all the produce again is sent to food pantries. Um, and the emphasis on our vegetables and herbs now are things that are used for eating immediately rather than for storage. In, in years past, of course, our ancestors would have been very interested in anything that they could put up for the winter. But because we go to the food pantries, we still have those vegetables, but we also try to focus on things that um, uh, we can take because the food pantry and the people that come to the food pantry don't, aren't really putting those things up, but they're needing them to eat um, immediately. So that's what we, we try to do. And it goes to the food pantry. This picture here, uh, the, those are Danvers carrots. That's a, an old variety of a Dutch variety that we have in the garden. It's a wonderful carrot and they, they look great. And this is our cabbage. We don't plant cabbage anymore. Um, we ha did in, in years past, but cabbage plants are very, take up a lot of space and we have limited space in the garden. And the other thing we found out about cabbage was our ancestors, particularly our German ancestors, would plant fields of cabbage. In fact, they would plant, um, they estimated how many part, depending upon how many were in the household, they would actually plant X amount of fields of cabbage because it was such an important part of their diet. So it was not part of the kitchen diet of the German, uh, the German uh, farm wife. So that, but that's a, uh, one of our cabbage uh, plants from the uh, couple of years past. And then we have just here, we have these beets and the corn that we um, had and it all goes to the food pantry. They must have eaten a lot of sauerkraut. <laughs> I think they did. It's so easy to put up, it's safe to put up and it, it, it goes with about anything German. So yeah, I think that's probably why. Um, and you can see, this is, this is an example. We, uh, we have potatoes there and it is so much fun to, um, to harvest the potatoes with uh, kids. They just can't believe that they put the pitchfork in the ground and up come all these potatoes like they see in the store. And this, the, the, the picture in the middle, that boy was just amazed. I think he got the biggest potato that we've had that season. <laughs> but it's just fun to have, have them, them see that. And uh, again, more of our, our beets and, and carrots and onions that, that we use and cucumbers, of course. In the bottom, kale, we, we um, grow a lot of kale. Um, we love it. The, the, um, the food pantries like it to a, to a limited degree, so we have to cut back on our kale because we, uh, our plants really produce. 
So let's talk a little bit about the German garden. Um, in 2018, again, the decision was made to plant it in the German tradition. And why we chose the German design? Well, many of our committee members were actually of German descent. Not surprising because Wisconsin was in large part settled by Germans. Um, so that's, you know, we thought that might be kind of fun to research that and, and, um, and uh, put the garden in that configuration. And um, the other thing too, that in doing our research, we found that the kitchen or peasant garden, or as Lee likes to say, the vernacular garden, they're all the same words. It's, it's, this, it's the garden that was, was grown by the everyday man. They were really a product of the German farm wife. Uh, she took great pride in her, her garden in Germany. And when she came over here, she also took great pride in her, in her, in her garden. In fact, most of the time the Germans were so proud of their kitchen garden that they put that in the front of the house so that anybody driving oh, driving by, walking by, whatever, coming by their house would notice the garden. In fact, I, I found a reference in a book that somebody was so in, intrigued by the beautiful gardens of the, of the uh, German farm wife and it said it, took, it takes, takes you several minutes to realize that the house behind it is really a hovel. I mean, these people, we're talking people of very limited means, but the garden was, was their pride and joy. And so that's why it was in the front of the house. Much of these traditions, however, though, have been lost over time. But again, through research, we wanted to learn some of what is no longer practiced and grown in vegetable gardens today. It doesn't take but a couple generations to lose that kind of oral history. And, and um, Laura and I were talking before, and it's, I've tried very hard to find a picture of what that kitchen garden looked like in a German kitchen garden. I have yet to find one in any of the books on Wisconsin gardening because they focus on the, 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 the farmer and what he was growing in his fields. And I've seen several pictures of the German farmer proudly standing in front of his cabbage field, you know, but <laughs> the, cabbage um, field. the cabbage field, I've seen lots <laughs> of pictures of cabbage fields, but I have yet to find a picture of uh, a German uh, kitchen garden. So I'm still on the lookout. I'll still look. <laughs> so anyway, what, what, how, where, how did this uh, come to be? Well, it, interesting, and, and it, it, co it dates back years, but it's cultivated by hand, not a plow. You can imagine that if you plant in rows, it makes perfect sense to take a plow and, and dig up your, 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 your garden. But if you're planting in, row, in, in, row, in um, uh, squares, which is what the Germans did, you don't use a plow. You do a lot of that digging up by hand. And a lot of the practices that people are recommending in, in uh, organic gardening now go straight back to what the Germans were doing way back when. So th the fact that you don't, you, you don't plow up your, 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 your garden each year because all you're doing is really plowing up and, get, and getting it nice and fertile and ready for the weeds. But what you do is you, you keep the soil um, ready you, and you only dig up what needs to, what you need to do to put your plants in makes lots of sense. And so when you look at organic gardening techniques today, you'll see a lot of the things that we found out were being done by the Germans years ago. And they're derived from monastery gardens of the middle ages. Years ago, it was felt that gardening was such an important thing that it couldn't be left to the masses of people. It could only be done in monasteries by the, by the monks. And, um, and then, it, uh, of course, that changed. But the beds were placed in geometrical patterns with ornamentals as borders. And it's traditional. In 795, Charlemagne dictated how, and when, when they decided that uh, the everyday man could um, have a garden, Charlemagne dictated what should be grown and how it should be grown. And that tradition has continued over a thousand years. A story in a book that I um, was reading, um, a man was very intrigued by um, the German gardens. Uh, in, this is in the early 20th century. So when he built his manor house, he wanted a kitchen garden in the traditional fashion. So he went to a local um, farm wife and asked her if she would help him design the garden. She did. 
And when she put it all together in her squares, she sat, she stood back and she said, now King Charlemagne would be proud. So <laughs> the, the oral tradition of how to have your garden and how it should be ha has been going on for over a thousand years. Um, and the peasants adapted their gardens based on the gardens of the vicarage. And when this all happened, what, 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 what became, what, what happened then was the monasteries, what they became doing, and, and a lot of the aristocrats began innovating with plants and that, and with different cultivars to get, to improve the, the plants that we have. And that's how you see all the various different cultivars that are now heirloom plants, but they were all developed in the, in the, um, many times in the monasteries. And of course, um, Mendel was a, was a monk that experimented with how to make better peas and how to, to, and of course got into genetics, but he was doing that because he was trying to improve the vegetables that they were growing in the monastery. And then by the late 1700s, these were then being incorporated into peasant gardens. Again, as I've said many times, the kitchen garden was tended by the farm wife. It was always fenced. It was small and usually facing south and east. And that's actually how our, our um, uh, garden at uh, Crossroads is configured too. It's a mixture of vegetables and flowers and herbs for flavor and medicinal use. Usually the, um, the, the farm wife was an expert in understanding how to use various herbs for medicinal use. And so she was often consulted uh, in the village and, and, and the surrounding areas for her, that knowledge and expertise. Again, it's usually in the front of the house, so it's visible to the neighbors so that you can show off all the, uh, how successful your, um, your garden is. And what the other thing, and this is again, what's old is new, you see in organic gardening, the very first thing they'll say is start with the soil. So, and, and, and that's critical. And the Germans knew that way back. They, the great care was to the soil, composting and manure, along with the use of cover crops to keep the soil so that it didn't, your, your good so topsoil didn't blow away in the winter, in the winter months. And all of this was designed, again, to keep the, the weeding down and to, to make sure that your soil was as healthy as it could so that your crop yield. And they also were involved early on with crop rotation and companion planting. I know you're going to have a, a talk um, in the next couple of weeks about companion planting. And that's, th that's something that um, we've been spending a lot of time with in the Heritage Garden is companion planting and, um, and crop rotation too. So um, that's, those are all things that have been part and parcel to the way Germans um, planted their gardens. Now here are some gorgeous pictures of, of just sort of what we're talking about when you talk about geometric designs and, um, and, and squares. And, and of course you can see on the lower, lower left, they, they were also doing raised beds early on as well. So um, th this, is, uh, this is not as, these are all um, wonderful examples. Our garden of course doesn't look quite as, as here's our garden. It's not quite as, as, as fancy as, as the, uh, the, those gardens, but nonetheless in the same tradition. And this was taken just a couple years ago. In the one picture, this is our, our, hay, our kale, which is just loaded. These are in the background against the wall are our hollyhocks. They're really not a traditional, um, it's a traditional flower and it's an old flower. Uh, the Germans would not have had the hollyhocks in the, um, in the garden probably. But as a, tr as a, as a um, homage to Marilyn, we, like, we think that they, they belong. Just like the birdhouse was built by one of the early people who helped put the, um, the uh, garden together, uh, the Germans, or, and even the English, would not have had a birdhouse in, in their garden, but it, nonetheless, it needs to be there. And there's some things, you know, you, you just need to, to do. Um, and, and we see, also created, a, yes. There's a question about what you, what you use for hedge, what bushes you use for the hedge. Well, actually, we don't have bushes uh, uh, for our hedge. We have a, we have a, um, a, a fence and, um, the, and the fence is, is, is blocks out things. So we don't grow anything, any specific hedge to um, alongside the garden, uh, in, the, in the garden. It's just, it's just the fence. We, we replaced it in 2017. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then we have our paths, and the paths are, are uh, and, and allow us to uh, get, get from place to, from square to square. And in, in these, um, in the, the, the little yellow flower on the picture on the right, 
are marigolds. Marigolds are a favored companion plant because of their smell that um, uh, discourage um, uh, nasty insects. Just another picture of just how lush our garden gets in um, uh, August. And are the paths made out of wood chips? The paths are no, the paths are made out of straw. The, the, one of the things that our ancestors would not have really had access to are uh, wood chips. So um, we use straw, they would have had straw or they would have used something like straw to, uh, so we use, we use straw, although we're considering putting a path, one path of wood chips, because one of the things that they did do is as they got a little more affluent, they would have made some of their paths more permanent and they might have used wood chips for that. So we're thinking of making one of our paths uh, that go straight in through the garden uh, wood chips, but keeping the straw in between the, um, the um, uh, squares. So yeah, it's, it's, it's straw. It's amazing how effective it is at keeping. In the back here, in, in the corner of the garden, you have to go all the way back is where our, our, our bench is. So please encourage you to come in and sit down and enjoy, just um, watch and enjoy the plants grow. Because actually, it, I go every day and I am amazed, well, this hot weather, hot, humid weather, it seems like the plants are growing inches, uh, growing before my eyes. So. Um, yeah, take advantage. Again, more, just more, more pictures of, and you can see in the lower uh, uh, left here, you can see how we've done the companion planting. We've got the marigolds in the foreground here. That probably next to the marigold is maybe a lemon balm. They're, they actually uh, are mini invasive. They're beautiful, they smell great, but they, and these are beets, the, the dark colored are beets with onions around the outside. They, uh, they all um, grow nicely together. It's a good example of that. And now one of the things we did, and the, the, this uh, easternmost side of the garden, we still have a little bit of the row kind of look. We, we had our potatoes in the far background there, and they just seem to sort of do better in, in a row. So we, we've done, but we're transitioning to making it then completely um, uh, squares in, in this part of the garden. You mentioned corn earlier. Um, do you have corn and how do you keep it from pollinating with um, corn all over the area? I hear it can travel miles. It can and what we do is we, we're we not growing corn this year and we, what we grew last year is a um, a variety or an Oneida corn. It's a it's a it's a corn revered by the um, Oneida tribe, and it's it's important to note that you have to be careful. You it's a sacred crop to the Oneida nation, and so you need to make sure that you get your your seeds or your 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 seeds from uh, somebody who they're not a sacred crop because that would be sacrilegious. So we got a, a, a Oneida corn, and we grew it as a novel as something to a showcase crop. So we grew Oneida corn for that reason. And you're right, we, you have to also have at least two rows of corn when you're, when you're growing corn to allow for, for pollination. And it's very, it's very tough to make sure, it, I, we don't save our seeds from our corn just simply because um, it, corn is a complex seed to save and you have to make sure you have enough corn and enough plants because you have to mix those kernels together to, in, in order to ensure that you get the genetic diversity um, from, the, from, the, from the corn. So we just grow it as a novelty crop. We don't grow it as a crop for, um, for consumption. Thank you. So now let's, oh, oh, go ahead. You were gonna say something? No, I, I'm also interested in that lemon balm. What do you do with it? What is it you? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I, I can't say I'm an expert on lemon balm, um, but um, it's, I don't know, to be, to be honest with you. It is a wonderful thing, though, to have around because it it's, has such a wonderful smell, a lemon smell, and it's a cute little plant. So it's, it's a nice companion plant, but um, I, I, I'll have to look that up for you. So well, I, I have some in my yard, and it has become kind of invasive. Yeah. So I pull it out, but I'm just wondering what could I do with it? 
<laughs> I, well, I, I, it, there's probably, I know for sure there is a medicinal uh, uh, reason that, that lemon balm is, is around, but I don't know what it is. And that's one of the things that I hope to get more um, involved in understanding when I, when I take uh, time to um, look and, and spend some time in our herb garden. I would then like to sort of get to know those plants a little bit better because I've really had fun the last five years getting to know the different varieties of heirloom plants and the stories that go behind them and just what they're involved. So stay tuned. I'll, I'll, I'll know a little more about herbs next time maybe. <laughs> So now, well, let's spend a little bit of time, though, on heirloom plants. I've talked about it, and, you know, what are they? Well, of course, like with anything in gardening, it seems, there's always controversy about the definition, which is, that's okay. That means it's a, 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 a discipline that's always in flux. But what, what's important about it, what nobody argues about, is it's open pollinated. That is, the pollination occurs by insects, birds, wind, or other natural mechanism. You don't need to, it, to um, it's not been uh, grown in the lab or anything like that. The other thing about it too is not, a, a, is there's a lot of genetic diversity in the plant. Um, there's a, a lot of gene characteristic, characteristics. And what this allows, this property allows a plant to adapt to its changing environment. You know, these plants have been around for thousands of years and they've survived without man being necessarily uh, uh, involved in their survival. They've had to survive by themselves. So there's a lot of plants, a lot of genes. Now, some of the genes may be silenced. If, like the plant probably has a gene in the case of drought. And in the case of a good, uh, a wet summer, that gene may be silenced. But in the case of if the next year it's, if there's a drought, that plant knows to activate that gene to allow itself to survive. And seeds are at least 50 years old. That's some people say 100, but at least 50. And I'm, I'm biased, but I really think generally they're more flavorful than hybrids. Most hybrids, that is things that have been modified by um, uh, usually in it, it fairly recently by mostly by, by um, plant companies, but they usually are trying to um, elicit the genes that are important in either um, tougher skins so that they can be transported or um, uh, things to be disease resistant by, by it, the insect resistant. And usually when you do that, when you try to um, uh, uh, encourage something, you usually lose another property of a plant. And oftentimes what suffers is, and if you want something that's perfectly round tomato, you, 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 uh, you select for that, you usually are, are suffering, the, the, the flavor is usually suffers when, when you do that kind of thing. And then you, you also need a stable genome and that what that means is the seeds that collected from the plant will be true to type so that you know if you collect the seeds from that plant and you grow them the next season, you will get exactly the same plant. And you don't know that necessarily with hybrids because the genome isn't stable. And it's, uh, it's always going to, it, so you, you're not sure if it's going to be um, something different. Uh, often, usually, uh, heirloom plants have a good story about the development, and it's often handed down through families. Remember, in the, in the 1800s, particularly the late 1800s, um, seeds were currency, and you had a lot of, of, of uh, people, migrant people going from place to place, and they would sell their seeds or they would trade their seeds with, with, with various folks. There's a story of a pepper that came from the Chesapeake Bay area that's a very hot pepper that um, people uh, were using in the, um, the, the crab chowder at the, at the uh, Baltimore Wharf. And this itinerant guy was walking through Ohio, traded these seeds, to an Ohio farmer, and that the, the, it was thought that these seeds were lost, you know, because they, a lot of seeds have, have disappeared. A lot of heirloom seeds have disappeared. Well, about five years ago, an old an old farmhouse, an old farmer died. They were cleaning out the attic. They found these peppers seeds from this guy from Baltimore, Maryland, 
and they're the old seeds, the, the old peppers, the hot pepper that was used in the, in the crab chowder. So it's like, you, you, it's like these are the kind of things you just can't make up. And these are wonderful stories that go along with a lot of the uh, heirloom on, and, uh, and heritage seeds. Um, and um, the seed library was giving out a beaver dam um, hot pepper. I wonder what the story is behind that one. Oh yeah, that would be fun to find out. Yeah, just like our Ken Poshke seeds that we have in Door County. Yeah, that, that would be really neat. And the other thing too is you will often hear that heirlooms are more sensitive to disease. And I think that that's not, it's, I mean, it, it can be true, but for the most part, if you've got a, a, a good seed and, um, and not, all, not all heirlooms are created equal, but if you've got a good quality seed, an heirloom seed, it can withstand a lot because it's, it's again, it's got a, a nice stable genome and it's got the ability to um, adapt itself, which is oftentimes hybrids can't do that. So now what do we grow in our garden? You've seen pictures of some of the things. And um, so we grow beets and in our, in our traditional um, uh, heritage garden, we would grow beets, corn, beans, carrots, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, onions, kale, and potatoes to just name most of them. And the herbs, somebody was asking about the herbs earlier. We grow fennel and we had fennel last year. It was beautiful. Thyme, rosemary, rhubarb. We have a rhubarb plant, which is, um, is we have now relegated it to the corner so we can control it. Um, <laughs> we've got borage, uh, mint, uh, basil, and uh, tansy. And of course, flowers. We are some flowers are just because they're pretty, and others uh, do double work as companion plants. But the Helianthus maximus that I pointed out in the slide earlier are are beautiful. We have asters in the in the um, fall. One of the things that Lee was really um, understood and appreciated is having the garden be in bloom all all, all season so that there are things always coming and going. And in the fall, when things are pretty much, the garden's city pretty much shutting down and, and there's not much going on, the asters just are pop, they pop. And they're on the north side of our, of our garden on the outside and they're just beautiful. I mean, I, um, I, I love them and some people think there's just a little too much of them. And I, it's like in that time of year, I don't think you can have too many asters uh, showing off. We have morning glories on our fence. We have hops growing up on one side and we have um, morning glories coming up on the other side. So in, uh, in August, you'll see the hops are, are the, the flower of the hop is there and the morning glories, the uh, grandpa Ots is an old uh, variety of morning glory, deep purple. So hopefully they are, they're just getting going. Uh, they're starting to send out their tendrils. Uh, the, the hops are beautiful coming up the one side, but the morning glories are a little bit late. Lovage. Lovage is a celery type. It smells like celery and it's used the same way. Uh, it has a beautiful flower. We have peonies, um, irises, daffodils, tulips, the poppies. We have had in the front for the last couple of years just a wonderful mass of poppies. They're not quite as spectacular this year, but hopefully we'll, we'll figure out a way to bring them back. Our lavender is, is beautiful and it's starting to really uh, flower um, even ahead of the ones I've got in my yard. Uh, pansies, black-eyed Susans, and geraniums. We have had scented geraniums. We researched that, and uh, scented geraniums were something that um, uh, were in flower boxes in um, a lot of homes, and they also would went overwinter them in the in in their in their house, and then bring them out in the in the um, spring. Uh, continuing the annuals, the marigolds, the nasturtium, snapdragons. What, cannas are not really an heirloom plant but they're so beautiful and they bring a little bit of pop into the garden. And so sometimes you have to make exceptions for some, for a plant that's, that uh, is pretty. So we do, um, dahlias and, and zinnias. And now, now a little bit of a companion planting and I won't take, I don't wanna take away from uh, the uh, talk you're gonna hear in a couple of weeks. Hopefully it'll give you, it'll pique your interest to go to the talk in, in a couple of weeks. Um, but companion planting, it's important to ward off pests and encourage the beneficial insects and pollinators into the garden. And so there are a couple ways that plants do this by working together. You have decoy plants that smell and look to, and to confuse an insect. And borage is, a, borage is a plant, I don't know if you're familiar with it, it's called the star flower. It's a light purple flower, small, and it's perfectly five, five uh, points. 
And what that, that can act as a decoy plant for the tomato plant. There's a particular tomato insect that it, the, it, instead of uh, going to the tomato, it gets confused by the way the, 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 the borage looks. And then, of course, doesn't uh, infect the tomato plant. So that's an example of a decoy plant. There's a chemical. Sometimes plants under stress will release volatile organic compounds to warn the nearby plants. And so um, there's an example of that. In, it, this is an area of research that's really coming into its own, and you're seeing more and more. But they were, there was uh, an example a researcher found that uh, there was a maple tree that looked diseased. and um, it when he when he examined it, it wasn't diseased at all, but it was showing out all the examples of it, and and they th they suspect in a way of of uh, warning you know his other plant buddies because plants communicate in ways that we're not uh, sort of totally aware of yet to warn nearby plants that there's an in infestation, and of course smell marigolds are the best example of that, and they're thought to deter aphids, and they they also deter uh, four legged. Uh, uh, invaders. We had a terrible problem this year with rabbits. In fact, I thought I was going to lose all the plants I'd planted in the garden th this year because of, of rabbits. And I didn't have my marigolds in fast enough, but rabbits do not like the smell of marigolds and tend to stay away. And again, what I said before, the German gardeners understood the importance of mixing flowers and herbs with their vegetables. And here's, you, if you go online, you can find a, a whole host of planting companion planting charts. And we try to, we, we have become really uh, attuned to things like this and have um, been um, using these, this in, in our garden at the Heritage Garden. And so uh, let's see how I'm doing for time here. Okay, I've got a few minutes. Um, some of the, now I've talked about what the, the, the plants that we have. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit of some of the varieties. This is not inclusive, but just a taste of what we grow in our garden. Now, our, the beets we use, the beets we use are the bull's blood beets. And, you know, as I've gotten more and more in gar into gardening, I realized it's so critical to sort of, when if you like, you want to grow beets or you want to grow tomatoes or something like that, study the different cultivars to figure out which one suits you the best. It's a fun, it's a fun exercise and it, it, it's great. Well, bull's blood beets are basically, beets are prehistoric. They've been recorded since before time. And the whole plant is prized, particularly this variety. This has the most gorgeous dark tops. You had a picture of that earlier. So it's grown for salads, and then it's grown for food coloring, for dyes, for ornamental use, as well as growing the, the beets just to, because they're good. It's a little bit on the sweeter variety of a beet, so we really like that. It's also a, a very hardy it's, it's a beet because beets can be sometimes hard to grow. They, they don't get really nice and big, or the ones that get big get a little too woody. This is a nice variety, and we, we, we like it a lot, and we, we grow it a lot. The Ornite, the Ornite corn we got, we got these, uh, uh, I got these seeds from a, a Sturgeon Base, uh, a Door County seed uh, saver colleague, um, and he assured me he was, he got them from a, a gardener who had used been growing Oneida corn in New York for many years. It was part of the diet of the Iroquois for over 2,000 years. It's sacred to Native Americans. So we grew this variety for the first time last year uh, with mixed results, but we, I, st I still collected this, the, the kernels, the seeds, and I'll, I'll, I didn't grow it this year, but we'll grow it again, just because it's nice to have it there and know that it's an, it's an Oneida, it's Oneida corn. Um, scarlet runner beans. Scarlet runner beans, it's really interesting. The story of most uh, varieties of beans, there are a lot native to the highlands of Central America. This is one. Um, but most of the time, these, these cultivars, these varieties, are discovered by our European ancestors who took them back to Europe, and then they come to the United States via the European path. So they don't come directly from Central America. They go to Europe and then come over here. They have edible flowers and they're productive and we save these seeds every year. Bean seeds are the easiest seeds to save. So, um, and they're growing up, in fact, they're just starting to bloom now in the, in the garden and they're growing up some of our teepees. I've got a runner bean teepee. The Danvers Caras, I talked about those a little bit earlier. Uh, they were developed in 1871 in, in Massachusetts. 
um, they're, they've been, carrots have been grown for over 5,000 years. The, net, the natural color of carrots is not orange, but they've been modified. The Dutch were big in, um, in uh, developing ver different varieties of, of carrots, as well as the French, but a lot of the times the Dutch. Um, and it gets its high orange color from the high level of beta carotene, and that's why we like carrots. Um, but they come in many different colors, and um, they're fun. Walking onions. We have walking onions in our, in our herb garden, and they have a Medusa-like appearance. And what happens is the top part gets like this lower picture. You've got this, 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 this crown of, of onions. And what happens is it gets top heavy, and it falls over. The whole plant falls over, and then these onions then take up you know the residence where they they fall and then you see next year you have a walking onion there and so that's how they they sort of walk their way through the garden in this way they can get out of control if you're not careful tomatoes we all have our favorites one of our favorites at the heritage garden is the brandywine it's been around so long it's got so many different stories that we don't know, is it heritage? Is it 1889 from overseas from an Ohio farmer who in 1982, you know, it's like you get all these interesting stories and they're oral, so you don't have any kind of way to document it early, but they've at least been around for a while. Uh, they're large and they're meaty and they're sweet and th th you can see, and, and they're red. Of course they're, and then the one of the ones that's become a personal favorite of mine is the purple Cherokee tomato. It's probably from the Cherokee purple from 1890. Nobody really knows. We grew it for the first time last year and we uh, saved the seeds from our, um, our Door County uh, seed saver colleague. And it has green shoulders, this part of this top part of the tomato, of course, called the shoulder. And that's typical of many heirloom varieties. They don't, uh, they don't um, ripen up. And that's again, why, you know, some, if you want this perfect, tomato, sometimes air looking tomato, sometimes heirlooms might not appeal to you, but when you taste them, you'll be, you'll be fans. Uh, one of the other new varieties we're growing this year, which I'm really excited about is the Paul Robeson tomato. It's a, it was to, just, it's an heirloom uh, developed in Russia and it, it, who have, Russia has a lot of the same uh, climate characteristics that we have in Door County. So I'm anxious to grow it in our garden this year. The, the rabbits decimated my plants, but I have one surviving Paul Robeson in my garden. The next is a chocolate cherry tomato. Uh, it's, it's not an heirloom, but it's a really, really sweet tomato. And we decided that we'd make the exception because if, if you have kids or anybody, even adults, who are coming to our garden and they want to taste it, it's so easy to pull, pick a cherry tomato. And that's why we grow the cherry tomato in, the, in our garden, so that people who come can taste the cherry tomatoes and they'll be believers in um, tomatoes after they've done that. Kale has been grown since the Middle Ages. It was developed in the Mediterranean and um, as early as the 14th century. And then England um, took, took uh, people in England took time to, to, to develop uh, different cultivars and um, made the differentiation between uh, head cabbage and loose leaf kale. And then the Scots developed this curly leaf variety, which is, is, is common in this country. And that's, it's, it's wonderful for um, drying and eating in salads and things. Nancy, do you yeah. allow people to pick things besides the cherry tomatoes or do you well, we, we, we or prefer cherry? people not to do anything up because we like to take those uh, the rest of our 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 garden to the to the um the food pantry but the tom the cherry tomatoes are fair game for anybody that comes into the garden for sure Good to know. yeah really <laughs> um and if if, if i'm there and, and it, when you come and um we've got if there are certain things that are getting crazy like we have chives in our in our um our uh, herb garden and so I'm happy to give away chives and and things like that so yeah but the cherry tomatoes are, are the only ones um, peppers again another example of a, of a vegetable that was cultivated in Central and South America over 2,000 years ago and brought to Europe by Columbus and uh, this is a, a Spanish pepper and it was introduced in 1860 in Europe and it became the rage in the French markets um, because it's so it's so big and it's, it's an example of, um, there was great interest in France, particularly in uh, developing cultivars of, of many of the vegetables that they like. And, 
and they take great pride in, in their vegetables there too. So um, this is one. We grew it one year and it, it didn't do very well. And I think the reason it didn't is because it was, it was a couple years ago when we had a little bit of a cooler summer and peppers, of course, like it hot, hot, hot. So our peppers this year in the garden, it's a California wonder. It's an heirloom. It, it has big green uh, pepper. We, I thought would be a really outstanding variety to have this year. And it's doing well, and that's because of the weather we have. This is ideal uh, tomato and pepper weather. Here's the borage I was talking about. Um, it's uh, and it gives you a nice. This is a nice picture of of the plant. You can't exactly see why it's called star flower, but um, this, it's a beautiful plant. Um, it's a wonderful for pollinators. So you just the bees are buzzing around it, and the bees are buzzing around this. They find your garden because of this plant, and then they they check out your other things in your garden, which is always really nice. So. It gets very big. I have just a few minutes, and so I just I want to just end with, you know, what are the other benefits to the heritage garden at Crossroads? It's beyond the learning, the planting, the growing, and the harvesting, which what we do, and we really love doing it. There are some other things, and it's one getting inspired. Um, we we garden with mostly women. Um, we garden with, um, and as we're gardening, we're solving world problems. We're uh, seeing how different varieties grow, getting ideas for what to do in our own garden. This one picture in the far right, uh, or on the right side, those are our red dahlias. Those are Wisconsin red dahlias. Um, and we have them all over the garden and they're just gorgeous. And so it's just, it's just a wonderful place to get a, get a it's also a, a, a creating a peaceful place. We'd like to think, this is a perfect I, I, example of, see th this, garden the, the the that's the hops are growing all, all on the um, around the arch and those are the the hops those are the fruits of the hops you can see um, but creating a, a peaceful place to just go in and sit and watch the bees come in watch the butterflies come in um, it's it's just it's wonderful to, to to and we encourage anybody to take time to to um, to uh, do that. So um, that's all I have. Are there any other questions that came into the chat? Now oh, I say, do you do anything with the hops? Um, we don't, but if anybody wants to come and pick hops for if they want to do make beer or something like that, uh, you can uh, feel free. They're, they're, they're there. Um, one of the interesting things about the hops is um, when we put the fence in and we put the new the new gate or the new archway the next year our hops didn't come back which means we 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 lost them so i did a little research on hops because i'd never grown hops before and i thought would it be really simple to just pull out some of those hop uh flowers or hop you know and, and let them dry out and there would be seeds and and then i in doing my reading it's like no that's not the way you do it hops you need a, you need to to get a a deep root of, of a hop so found a, a, another place where hops were going okay, cut, got some deep roots and put them in in the fall. And mm -hmm. we, got our, we got our hops back last year. So I was really, really glad that, that we had. And, and as gardeners, you know, it's like, if something doesn't work this year, you know there's always next year. I guess we're optimists at, at, at heart. And so, um, but so the, the hops are looking beautiful this year uh, uh, that are coming over the um, archway. So yeah, it's fun. Nice. Yeah. Um, I wonder, I have parsley in my garden that keeps coming back every year. Is it a perennial? I didn't think it was, but it seems I, to be because it didn't die all winter. I didn't think so either, but nonetheless, if you have it in the right place, one of the things that I'm pulling out and I, we pull out every year are tomato plants from the seeds that were in, in, in the ground. And, you know, tomatoes should not, you know, come back every year, but nonetheless, you do. So any plant is capable of, of doing that, I guess, you know, because I'm, I'm still pulling out uh, tomato seedlings that, that came up from the seeds that were, that had fallen to the ground last year, you know, in, in, in the garden. So yeah, I, it, it's interesting what plants it will, uh, will do. It can surprise you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed this. Uh, please take time to come and uh, visit our garden. Thank you very much for giving the program. I find it fascinating. I'm going to have to go over there very soon and have a look. <laughs> yes, please do. Please Not do. a full garden this year, but. Yeah, thanks wonderful. a lot. Thank you.